Um, so my name is Tony Garge. I'm from the IBM Development Lab in Böblingen. I've been working since about three and a half years now on KVM. Uh, my focused areas, I'm the systems management architect uh, for KVM cross-platform within IBM. So I'm sort of, sort of a bridge between what we do in the open source space and how our products use it. And my focus is going to be pretty much here, the different open source solutions which are available to manage KVM. Okay? So please do ask questions whenever you wish to. Uh, very briefly, the agenda. I'm going to talk about very briefly about why uh, our customers are using KVM in a cloud environment. Then I'll be talking about the various uh, KVM management, data center management and cloud center ma and uh, cloud management solutions available today. And then I'll be going through a couple of uh, customer scenarios, which uh, customers who have built little clouds and big clouds and are using KVM today, uh, giving a little bit of feedback on you know, what experiences they've had and finally come to conclusions. So what are the four main reasons why IBM, cust why our customers, or why typically you know, people sort of use KVM? And these, these are the main four reasons here. So I'll start off with security, get a little bit in detail into that. Then I'll go into the performance aspects of the hypervisor. Um, and then of course costs is not unimportant, especially for customers using VMware. And finally, and this is gonna be my main focus of this presentation, I'll be talking about the various virtualization and cloud management solutions available there to manage KVM. Okay, so let's talk about security first. So if you're using, um, or if you're deploying a cloud, or if you're running a cloud, you very often run into a situation, whether you're in, working in a completely intranet environment or whether you're working in a public cloud environment, that you need to isolate your customers. So for example, um, if you're lucky to have Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola as your customers, you really don't want that the virtual machines, when running on the same host, are able to access or share the same data. So you need to isolate those virtual machines. And one of the ways, not the only way, but one of the ways to ensure such isolation is, for example, using SE Linux. And I'll show you in the next slide how it works. Um, the point is, it provides you this mandatory access control security. And so if you have SE Linux enabled, to be precise, if it is enforced, uh, then you can ensure that those virtual machines are not able to access each other's data. Of course, you also need to add other aspects like storage security and network security, but SE Linux gives you a very good starter up. Um, the main thing which I really want to point out is that both the primary um, distros, both uh, RHEL, starting with RHEL 6.2 uh, with KVM and SLES 11 SP2, both have the EAL 4 plus certification. And you know, this is not just uh, normally just a check mark, but this gives you a very, if you, if you look at the documents, uh, how they get it, uh, this gives you a very precise configuration on all what you need to do in order to get such certification. It's always very advisable to go in configure it in a similar fashion. So this is extremely important and um, KV, KVM was this, uh, one of the first uh, um, open source hypervisors which got this certification actually last year. So how does um, SE Linux work? So let's say this is your hypervisor here, your KVM hypervisor, a part of the Linux kernel, and you have three virtual machines on them. And let's just assume that for whatever reason you had some code running in this virtual machine which sort of um, attacked this particular virtual machine which embedded itself in this virtual machine. Now you want to ensure, and this is what exactly SE Linux does in combination with SWIRT, that this particular virtual machine is not able to attack this virtual machine and that this particular virtual machine is not able to attack this host OS here. And this is basically what gives you the isolation. What SC Linux enablement also gives to you is the fact that this particular virtual machine then is not able to write to the virtual machine image of this particular uh, virtual machine and vice versa. So these are just very basic high level aspects of how SC Linux works. In addition, we also have the audit deed daemon which allows you to basically lock all livert interactions. So all interactions whenever you've started a, a virtual machine or deleted it or changed it attributes or, or, or whatever. So all those are locked here. And uh, very often our customers, they require 
that any actions which are done with virtual machines that they're locked by in terms of which user ID did it and when and what actions were executed. Okay. So for example, we have um, a bank um, for whom it was extremely important that they use a hypervisor which had AL4 plus certification and which, was, and which also had an auditing facility available so it could trace all the events. Okay, so this was just one aspect of, um, of uh, security. Another aspect why KVM is being used is because it really provides excellent performance. And I, and I won't go into all, the, uh, into all the standard virtualization metrics which are typically available, but I'd like to pick out two examples, real world examples. This is a real ex world example of um, both, uh, these, these were two different scenarios both running KVM. Here, in this case, it was one virtual machine on a host, on a KVM host, on a RHEL 6.4 host, um, running a virtual machine running Microsoft Exchange Server. And so if you look at this axis here, uh, this contains the number of users which were simulated, 2,000, 4,000, 12,000, and 20,000 users. And there's a typical industry-wide acceptance that if you're running Microsoft Exchange Server and you do a send mail transaction, that should have completed within 500 milliseconds. That's the general industrial, um, industry wide acceptance rate. And you will see, if you see all these blue ones, boxes here, bars, it was always way below any 500 millisecond limit. And this was while running one virtual machine. Um, this red line here shows the CPU utilization rate. And as you can see, the CPU utilization rate was extremely low, so it showed a lot of area for growth also if you wanted to do that. Um, this is in the case of one virtual machine running on a host. This particular uh, graphic here shows the case of multiple virtual machines running multiple instances of the Microsoft Exchange server. So for every 4,000 uh, users, we added another virtual machine, actually a pair of virtual machines. Um, and so it basically shows you there too, if you look at those blue boxes, you always had a response rate in which 95% of all send mail transactions were below the 500 millisecond mark. There, again, the red line here shows you the CPU utilization, which was also there left enough room for growth. So what are these two, and, and, and by the way, um, this was very comparable to the results which VMware had, VMware 5.0 had. Um, there, the detailed results are available here for KVM and here for uh, VMware. They were very comparable, um, and it also shows that even for Windows applications, uh, KVM had an excellent performance. Let me just show you just one more um, performance relevant data here. Again, something from a real world. And what, uh, in February this year, there was a TPCC result published uh, by IBM. Uh, this was using RHEL 6.4. Um, our uh, database server, DB2. And of course we were running on a pretty powerful machine. But what we saw was really this is the highest TPCC result ever published for a virtualization technology. So there, two, if you just take these two examples, you know, it shows that even in real world, uh, in real world, let's say scenarios, we are, I mean, KVM is, is, is really fantastic. And that is really an important argument in addition to the security argument for customers using um, KVM in the cloud environments. This is a third argument why um, many customers use KVM, mainly to save costs. And this is typically either saving costs versus the usage of VMware or saving costs versus using Hyper-V. So the way you can read the chart is um, we had, uh, so, so, so the three-year cost analysis which we did was based on um, purchase of normal software licenses whether it's RHEL or whether it's management software, and then a three-year support, and then taking the total cost and then, and then comparing those costs. 
So if you had a completely 100% uh, uh, let's say 100% uh, workload with 100 virtual machines, um, in terms of savings versus VMware, it was anything between 20 and 50%, uh, whether it was versus VMware or it was versus Hyper-V. If you were taking a mixed workload, that is, let's say, 50% Linux machines and 50 Windows machines, uh, again, we had significant savings versus VMware. Of course, versus Microsoft, we started losing, this, uh, we started losing the other benefit because um, if you're running Hyper-V, you tend to get your Windows licenses pretty much for free. And if you only had a Windows guests environment, 100 virtual machines, Yes, we were at a disadvantage versus Hyper-V, but uh, as far as VMware, because we were still pretty much uh, cheaper. This is, this is using you know, very normal standard um, supportable products, whether it's RHEL uh, or whether it's the management services. You can further reduce the costs if you start, let's say, using CentOS and other open source tools like Overt, which I'll come to a bit later. Okay. So those were the three main reasons for using KVM. Uh, by the way, uh, this, is, this, is a, this is an organization, Opal Virtualization Alliance. Um, it was announced uh, on the first day of this conference that is now a new Linux Foundation collaboration project. And the objective of this particular virtualization alliance is to increase the overall awareness of KVM, to bring developers and consumers of KVM together to foster an ecosystem. I'll be talking about that later on, what we mean by an ecosystem, and to encourage interoperability. Uh, the five, it, it has lots of members, 250 and still counting. These are the five um, governing members, HP, IBM, Intel, Red Hat, and NetApp recently became a governing member. Um, so there's a lot of uh, focus also, um, not only from Red Hat and from IBM, but also from others to really make a push here. Okay, I'm thinking I'm gonna skip this chart because I, I, I assume everybody knows you know, how, how, how a KVM hypervisor is uh, structured. I think I'll take this one out too. So, summarizing. Um, because of the security aspects, performance aspects, price aspects, KVM is really a very good and natural fit for cloud environments. Um, it's not only just SE Linux, you also have C groups, which allows you to give certain soft and hard limits to how many resources, how many CPU resources, how much memory resources a particular virtual machine can get. Um, it's scalable and economical as you've been seen in the previous charts. But, but, in order to make KVM successful, it's not only about the hypervisor. You need lots of things around it. You need management solutions around it. You need ecosystems around it you need software which is certified to run on it. Because until all this is available, um, customers will just not make a decision based just on the characteristics of the hypervisor. And so, that, so therefore, I wanna now talk about these other aspects which are extremely important to customers. Okay. Um, so what I wanna show here is try to categorize or group the different types of management solutions which are available today for KVM, okay? So I'll start at the bottom, you have the different hypervisors. In this particular circle or eclipse, you have what we call the data center virtualization managers. Um, what are the typical uh, pro properties? They're optimized for longer living um, virtual machines. Um, it's, everything is pretty much centralized and most of the focus is on a centralized API or in a centralized GUI. Examples, and I guess everybody knows examples from there, is if it's from VMware, it's vCenter, or if it's from Microsoft, it's, uh, for, it's a System Center 2012 for Hyper-V. Um, for KVM, it's typically Overt slash RevM, Overt being the upstream project, RevM being the product from Red Hat. And here in IBM, we also have um, a flex system management, which does pretty much the same functionality as the others do. On the right-hand side, you have these cloud infrastructure services. Those, I, the properties of those cloud infrastructure services is they tend to manage virtual machines which are short-living. So perhaps high availability is initially not important for them. 
because if something fails, they just start up something, a new virtual machine somewhere else. Um, they're, they're very often decentralized, allows them to scale to a very high degree, and they're really centered around automation. So they're not very strong in GUIs, for example. And I've deliberately um, painted this or, or drawn this in an overlapping fashion because we are seeing that infrastructure services like, here, like the ones here are moving into this space and virtualization managers are moving into this space. So there is an overlap and there is a trend to go exactly the other way, to, to go and, 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 and attract exactly the other uh, focused areas. Then you have the cloud manager at the top. An example for a cloud manager is the vCloud suite, for a suite from uh, VMware. There are other cloud managers also, for example, platform computing or the IBM smart cloud family. And their focus is pretty much on business services. So things like, you know, metering and billing and getting the money for usage of, of these systems back. Um, but also, focus is very much on having an extremely richly, uh, a rich functional image, uh, image management functionality there, and things like that. So, so this is where I put the cloud managers in. And please keep this, or please try to keep this in your mind when we talk about the individual solutions here, okay? So um, before I start, I just want to mention one thing here. Um, today, the uh, today KVM comes with a, with a out-of-the-box uh, management tool called Vert Manager. I don't know if any of you folks have used it. Um, it's not always um, easy to use. So uh, Ivan has been working on a new project called uh, Kimchi um, out on GitHub. And, the, idea, and uh, the objective is always to offer a web browser-based, extremely simple, low-end management tool to manage a very limited number of KVM boxes. Okay? So you can do very basic functionality, uh, you know, create and delete virtual machines, attach disks, attach networks, um, and then open up a, a VNC session to it. Um, this is a very new uh, open source project. Uh, it's, it's, been, it's been published on GitHub, and the latest release came out um, last week, and uh, please have a look at the website there. And, yeah. Okay, so, but now let's get into now what we call the data center. This was, the, this, was this, um, let's talk about solutions here for KVM. I would say the main project, the main open source project, available in this space is Overt. The latest release, 3.3, came out uh, in September. And it offers you, so if you folks know what vCenter is, Overt is the closest to vCenter. It not only allows you to manage the life cycle of virtual machines, but it also allows you to deploy the hypervisors, to attach the storage, to attach networks, to do live migration, to do live storage migration, and things like that, okay? And the latest release, 3.3, has also started now its integration with OpenStack components. So this means that if you have images in the Glance component, you can import them into Overt if you have networking services in quantum, now Neutron, you can consume them in Overt. So a certain amount, as I mentioned, uh, you know, moving towards into other person's space is already happening there. It also offers uh, important services which are important in a data center. For example, high availability. So if a host fails, and it has determined that the host has failed, it will start up those virtual machines on a different host. Okay. It also offers support for live snapshots. It also offers support for live storage migration, things which are important in traditional data centers. Um, okay, so this is very briefly what Overt is. So while Overt is the upstream version, just like Fedora is upstream and RHEL is downstream, Rev is 
the Red Hat product, which productizes and, and, and makes overt support available to customers. So typically enterprise customers, um, they purchase Rev from IBM, uh, sorry, from Red Hat, okay. Um, although I think, I think uh, IBM also sells uh, as a proxy Rev to our customers too. In fact, we have a number of customers who combine IBM hardware and IBM storage with Rev. So it's, it's a cooperation there. Um, so these are just some of the important aspects of, uh, of, of, of Rev which are available. Um, pretty, every, pretty much everything which is available in Rev is also available, uh, is already available under Overt and there's a typical, you know, five to six month uh, uh, time period until a new Rev release comes out after a new Overt release has come out. Just to give you, this is a Red Hat picture. I should have mentioned it, it's sourced by Red Hat. So this shows the architecture of Rev. So it supports today both the RHEL hypervisor and the Rev H hypervisor, which is a part of the Rev product. Um, it contains the Libvirt um, library, and it also contains an agent on each of these hosts. It then has a central management server, which is a JBoss application. Um, this puts its data into a Postgres SQL and can also use different directory services. Um, and then it offers all the functionality which I showed you on the first chart, either via an admin portal or via CLI shell or a REST API and also it also allows you a, sp a specific user portal so that certain users can do certain functions. Okay, I should, have, I should be mentioning it also offers um, VDI support via the SPICE protocol too. So this is the Rev architecture. Um, SUSE also has solutions to manage KVM. They are not as rich in functionality as Rev. Um, so running on a SLES um, hypervisor, SLES KVM hypervisor, you have the SUSE Studio, which allows you to build appliances. You can combine with the help of SUSE Studio, okay, you know, give me this operating system, it could be a SLES or a RHEL, and combine it with a certain application, some, some LAMP stack, for example, it creates for you the virtual machine appliance and then it allows you to either deploy it in AWS or in a, any specific other cloud. Or of course it just generates the image for you which, so that you can deploy it yourself later on. Uh, the SUSE Cloud 2.0, it's OpenStack based. Uh, it, it's not, it doesn't only, it not only contains OpenStack but also components from Crowbar and other components. And then you have the SUSE Manager which focus, as far as from a KVM perspective goes, is provisioning of virtual machines, limited metrics, but it's mainly, it has many to do with patch management. Okay, that's, that's the focus of SUSE Manager. Okay, so. Um, there have been a number of uh, presentations, uh, both yesterday and today, and probably tomorrow also, on OpenStack. And I'm going to want to go very briefly from a KVM perspective and then later on from an IBM perspective on what we're doing for and with OpenStack. So um, it was mentioned, I think, yesterday that there are about 1,000 developers which have contributed to OpenStack already. Uh, by the way, um, the latest release is the Havana release. It came out last Thursday or last Friday. And in six months, the next release is going to be called Ice House. Um, so OpenStack contains a number of key components. Nova, which allows you to provision virtual machines, large clusters of virtual machines. Neutron, which provides you networking services. Um, Swift Cinder, which allows you object store and block storage support. Horizon, which is a GUI. Glance, which is an image registry and Keystone, uh, which provides you authentication and authorization for different aspects. Starting with the Havana release, 
We are now also have two graduated projects called HEAT, which is an open, which is an OpenStack orchestration component, and SiloMeter, which allows you metering. So those two are the new components which graduated in the Havana release. Um, this, uh, I won't go into all the details, but what I do wish to mention here is um, most of the interaction with the KVM hypervisor take place in the Nova Compute component. So in the Nova Compute component, it has a libvirt driver, and this libvirt driver interacts then with this particular one or more instances of the KVM hypervisor. Okay. Um, OpenStack, there was, a, there was a user committee um, questionnaire six months back, and this was a result of about 220 um, feedbacks and showed, and I've included it here to show to you that the primary hypervisor of choice for people using OpenStack today is KVM. There are other hypervisors too, but as you can see, in an extremely small minority. Um, in fact, um, when OpenStack is being built or when code is being integrated, then there is a very extensive testing which is done mainly and primarily on KVM. So you could assert that KVM is the best tested platform for OpenStack today. Okay. This, give, this is a brief um, heat chart. So when IBM started working on OpenStack, we started looking at aspects where we thought OpenStack is good enough, where we thought it should be improved, or where we thought isn't it, there are areas which are not applicable to OpenStack. So obviously, I mean, you know, things where it's really good at is role and authentication management, um, VM provisioning and VM image construction. We believe that it has you know, missing capabilities for monitoring, capacity planning, and surface orchestration. But there were areas which we think, you know, OpenStack doesn't play a role like license management and patch management. And so we are in our activities, in our IBM activities, we are trying to improve within the community aspects which we think are missing in OpenStack from an enterprise perspective. Just the same way, just the same way we, we did a few years back with Linux. So let's take the area of compute. This is the Nova component. Um, we're adding IBM teams are adding high availability enhancements. Again, this is a picture of where we started off where on the right hand side you had cloud infrastructures moving towards data supporting data centers. This is also what customers, our customers are asking us that they would like to use OpenStack, but they would like to use it in the data center, and so they're missing you know, high availability aspects. They would like to see richer resource scheduling. Uh, we helped in initially making the scheduling architecture more flexible, and now we're also plugging in, making capable to plug in other schedulers. Um, live upgrade contribution so that you don't have a very disruptive upgrade when you're moving from Grizzly to, let's say, Havana. Um, and then also we're enabling our IBM systems, um, both P systems, uh, whether it's um, um, Power VM or whether it's KVM on Power, our IBM systems, but also you know our software like DB2 to be used with OpenStack. We're doing also a lot, you know, internal testing and validation. A lot of it is automated. Um, in the networking aspect, we're supporting you know the version two APIs. And previously, a lot, of, uh, a lot of networking, Nova had its own network component. Now most of it has moved over to Quantum, or actually it's called Neutron. Um, we're also enabled, we've also enabled Cinder drivers for GPFS. GPFS is, is a highly scalable uh, storage subsystem in, for IBM, and we're also supporting the SV7K products. Um, in terms of shared, shared services, which are basically used by all the other components, we have added in support for LDAP and NAD. Um, and of course, then we're doing general OpenStack contributions, specifically in the area of translation and QE, 
so that every time a patch goes in, an OpenStack environment is created on a VM, a complete OpenStack environment that gets tested. Only if it passes there, then the patch is accepted. So these are areas which we're uh, doing community facing to improve OpenStack for everybody. Um, we also have a whole bunch of products. I won't go to <laughs> don't be scared. I won't go into details here. Just want to show you the different products which we have to manage KVM. Um, for our IBM software portfolio, KVM is a tier one platform, which means that a very high percentage of our software is supported to run as guests on KVM, both on rel guests and on Celeste guests and on Windows guests. This is something which, you know, this is a part of the ecosystem which we are sort of pushing for. Then, as I said, you know, the customer says, okay, I'm convinced that the hypervisor is good. I'm convinced that one of the other management solutions is good. But if I'm going to run this piece of software called, I don't know, Gradient from IBM, have you certified that it runs on a KVM hypervisor? And if you tell them no, then it doesn't really help all that much if you have an excellent hypervisor. Okay, um, one of our products called PureFlake supports uh, KVM. It does lots of you know management functionality, power on, power off, live migration, delete, and I won't go into that. We can talk about details if you want to do it later on. Um, Smart Cloud Entry. This is something which which I do wish to talk about. Uh, this is a product which allows you to manage appliances, to manage flavoring, and for KVM. It uses OpenStack underneath the covers. To be precise, it'll be using OpenStack Grizzly. Right now, it's currently in beta. Um, but it allows you to do, um, you know, first of all, you can, you, you can define VMs in terms of flavors, which are, of course, backed in by OpenStack flavors, Nova, Nova flavors. It allows you to do also approvals and expiration of virtual machines. So very often, especially in a, in, a, in a cloud environment, everybody's creating virtual machines, but nobody's really stopping or deleting them. So you, just, so you get this huge number of virtual machines. Um, and it also allows you a simplified out-of-box experience. So all the OpenStack controller components, or the so-called managed from components, they come packaged in one virtual machine. And then it comes with additional software to, to deploy the necessary OpenStack agents plugins uh, or Neutron plugins or Nova agents into your, into your individual hypervisors. So, so that's coming um, very soon. The other tool which we have from IBM, which also uses OpenStack underneath the covers as an infrastructure as a service, is Smart Cloud Orchestrator. So I showed you the previous chart where we think OpenStack is missing some things. So we have enriched in SCO OpenStack with an image management tool. This is best compared to, let's say, a, a code, a code like, like a GitHub. So it allows you to manage different versions of the images. It allows you to catalog which image, uh, sorry, which image version is running on which virtual machine. Um, extremely rich there. It allows you also to build multi-tier applications. So <laughs> if your application contains, let's say, of two web, of two a web servers, three databases, um, a load leveler. It, 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 uh, it combines all these different um, appliances and deploys them on different systems. Orchestration, it has a lot of plugin support for uh, plugging in uh, orchestration of Cisco networks and Jupyter networks, for example. And it also has support for monitoring and backup and restore. So this is, it shows an example on, while well, on the one hand, IBM is contributing towards um, you know, improving OpenStack for everybody. Uh, we are also using uh, OpenStack within a number of our products, and we're enhancing certain features, which are only available then in our products. Uh, today, this SEO supports both uh, VMware and KVM, and support for Power VM is coming next, um, next month. So, well, in terms of OpenStack, and I think this was also briefly, I don't know if the same chart was, no, I don't think it was, shown by Mac Devine this morning. When we talk about OpenStack, we pretty much concentrate here on infrastructure as a service. What we're seeing, however, is things are moving up. People, our developers are more interested in platform as a service. That is what they would like to do is 
they would like to develop an application, plugging in components like give me a single logon API, give me a database API, um, and combine it to build applications. And this is where um, IBM um, and Pivotal have now created this cloud foundry here, which is going to be the core of uh, our platform as a service infrastructure. Uh, Blue Mix is are the IBM add-ons on top of uh, Cloud Foundry. You can go to ibm.com slash bluemix um, to get more information there. Um, so this just sort of shows you where our focus is. As I said, OpenStack for infrastructure as a service and Cloud Foundry on a platform as a service. So I want to talk about a couple of uh, use cases here. So of course, we're talking about you know, Linux server consolidation and cloud computing is uh, all these are different uh, use cases for KVM, VDI support, uh, hosting of virtual appliances, managed service provides in multi-hypervised environments. Um, this chart just shows you very briefly um, industry-wide um, customers using um, KVM. Uh, the Google Compute Engine, for example, the HP Public Cloud is using KVM. And this is a list of um, IBM customers today who are using um, KVM. And this is just a small subset. Uh, there is a, there is a, there's a URL here which you can get uh, many more details on the customers, IBM customers using KVM today. So I'm going to skip to the benefit of time a, two or th a couple of slides here to just show you for example, oh, let me just show you one thing here. So this was a customer, a communication service provider in China. And what he had was he had different systems. He had a power, uh, uh, you know, IBM power um, um, cluster, and he had um, x86 clusters. And what he was having a problem was of, you know, deploying, of deploying the servers, of uh, deploying virtual machines on those servers. And um, what, he, what we suggested to him was to use um, smart cloud entry uh, together with RHEL KVM for the x86 part. And this helped him, first of all, to utilize his service much more. This was, this was more of a Linux consolidation story here. And it also helped him to reduce the time for um, deployment of his um, service there. Mac this morning talked about software. And so I wanted to give you a little bit of few details on what our software is all about. And this basically gives you very briefly the technology capabilities of software. This is IBM's public cloud. At best comparable, I know, perhaps it's politically wrong, with AWS and others. So first of all, in the software, you can provision dedicated metal servers, bare metal servers. Very rich characteristics which you can choose and um, you know, with corresponding billing and time to provisioning. What you can also do is, um, you can also get a cloud computing instance. This is, you can also provision and ask for virtual machines. Okay? Um, what you can then also do is, you can also have a bare metal cloud computing instance, which is a variation of this. And lastly, but not least, is this particular element. You can ask for your own private cloud. You can ask for your own private cloud, which is hosted within software. Today, officially, that private cloud is based on Zen server and CloudStack. I would not be surprised, again, this is not an announcement, that in future, such a private cloud could also be OpenStack-based, right? So you could say, okay, give me, with a very few and limited number of APIs, a privately, sorry, a private, uh, my own OpenStack-based cloud, okay? With, for example, KVM hypervisors. Uh, this is a link to the IBM Success Stories book, which I had mentioned um, earlier. 
Um, there's also some more information from IBM on, on, on KVM. It's not, ju it's not just sales information, it is all, although that's good too. It's, uh, you also have a lot of links to, to technical information, best practices for KVM, best practices for security on KVM and things like that. And so coming to an end, um, KVM is an open source alternative. It's an extremely powerful open source alternative. And uh, we think it's, 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 a much better, it's a much better choice not only for lower cost and higher performance, it has a rich ecosystem and now it, there's also lots of um, virtualization management tools available for that, which were perhaps not available two years back. So, um, with that, I hope I didn't put everybody else to sleep before lunch. Any questions? I'm sorry, I had to skip a few slides because uh, it's not late. Yes, please. Uh, you spoke about Um, I would need to check on details on that, but I would not. I would not expect that it is more than five to seven percent. But I would need to check. If you can leave me your details, I can give them to get that. Okay. Any other questions? Perhaps I was too fast because I started off so late. Okay. If that's not the case, thank you very much.